and for the people. I'm Jim Gardner. With the parade now over, it is time to turn our attention to the great American picnic going on at Penn's Landing by the Philadelphia waterfront. And for that, let's go live to Wally Kennedy and Liz Starr. Jim, I'll tell you, just as things are beginning to wind down in the parade, they're really beginning to pick up here, uh, wouldn't you say? We the people is uh, more than a slogan here. We the people are all together. It gives me the feeling of one of those old 60s BMs. Yes. Uh, it, it, it is a picnic, in fact, because a lot of food is being sold, but people just want to hang around. They, they, they want to stay together. And you can see that it's attracted an enormous number of people. What's interesting at this hour is that apparently a lot of people are either taking off early from work or businesses have decided to close earlier. There's flex True. time. So what you're finding is the people in the suits and the business clothes are starting to filter in among the people who all got rained on, like Wally and me earlier in the day. The other funny thing about we've been talking to people all along is in spite of the fact that all of us took a little rain this morning, the kind of weather it is is, we've all drifted dry. <laughs> yeah, that's true. We're on like our second or third wind as far as the rain goes. But actually, we've been fairly fortunate, I would think, in the last hour and a half, two hours, really not a drop. And a lot of people have come to realize that this is a good day. This is the day to come down for the picnic. A couple of notes that we want to pass on to you. First of all, USA Today is handing out free souvenir additions and balloons to people down here. There's also an interesting uh, sign that is not too terribly far from where we're broadcasting to you. There's a sign that is constantly updating what the current population of the USA is, taking into account deaths and births all on this day. And uh, it's one of the many things, including four different stages where entertainment is being featured. And we're going to be visiting some of those stages. As a matter of fact, right now, Harry Martin is standing by several hundred yards to our left. Harry? Okay, Wally, we are standing by here with uh, two people who, uh, well, it looks like they're chowing down on, on just two of the estimated 60,000 soft pretzels which are going to be consumed over the next four days here. Uh, with me right now, this is Jackie West, and uh, this is Lavinia, Lu Lavinia Sawyer. Sawyer. And this is your first time down here, right? Yes. I've been to the restaurant, the Michelou, for dinner, but I hadn't walked around on the uh, grounds. Yeah, what do you think so far, Jackie? I love it. I'd spend any Sunday afternoon down here. I love it. I'm having a ball. Really? I what, really am. What's your favorite part? My favorite part is the restaurant. The restaurant? All the way up on the top deck. Yeah, yep. I love that. And the soft pretzels, right? Yes. You're of both... course, soft pretzels are the best. <laughs> <laughs> You're both from Germantown, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, I hope you have a good time down here. We are waiting for uh, more musical entertainment. That's going to be coming up. In fact, it's going to be going on all for the next entire four days. A masala is a, a soft Latin sound that we're waiting to hear. And uh, they're going to be along in just a moment. Let's go and uh, see how Robin Garrison is doing. She is at another section here in Penn's Landing. Harry, I think the word is jamming. I think that's what we're doing here on Penn's Landing at the West Walnut Stage. The group on stage is a Philadelphia group. They're called Big Push. Now, there's one problem. The ground around here is kind of a parking lot, and it's wet, so people can't sit down. But that's okay, because if you're standing up, it's easier to move with the music. Let's listen. people that were lining the Ben Franklin Parkway must have come out here to the Great American Picnic. Joining me now are two people, Stephen, come on over here, who are from South Philly, who are having a good time, as from what I can tell, this is Kathy and Stephen Langendorf. What do you think so far? This is fantastic. You were Wonderful. at home watching television at first, and what happened? Well, then we decided to come down. What do you think you, you like best about this? Uh, just in the middle of all the celebrations, really exciting. Anything in particular you'd like to see and do most? Well, the Ben Franklin lighting I would like to see, and the firework, and just being around everybody, it's really nice. What about you, Stephen? What would you like to see? 
the Ben Franklin Bridge also. What are you watching over there? You know, I had a hard time getting your attention. What are you watching? What were you watching over there? Soldiers in March. Do you like them so far? Well, I hope you two enjoy the, the rest of your, the day out here, and I've enjoyed talking nice. with you. Thank you very much. All right, back to you, Liz and Wally. There are four stages of entertainment here at Penn's Landing with continuous entertainment planned not only for today, but also for the next three days. This is a four-day picnic. We've been speaking to people who've been gathering around our broadcast booth, and, you know, we've talked to people from every part of the Delaware Valley, and in every case, I've asked them, how did you get here? And in most cases, people have been pretty creative about combining driving to a certain point and taking public transit. And the fun thing for me is talking to those people who've never took public transit before. They're sort of delighted that it, yeah, you can take a bus, and it works. And and then the other people who, uh, who are familiar with public transit and they swear by it. And, and the, the only one thing I've heard is uh, from a bus driver. I was talking to a SEPTA bus driver who's, who was on a break and he pointed out, please ask anybody who is going to get on a bus to be a little bit patient because uh, bus routes are being rerouted. The bus drivers are doing the best that they can. Well, you know, Liz, one of the first things that really stood out this morning when I got here about a quarter after eight is the Royal Viking Sky, which is a ship that is so much a part of the celebration, uh, which is going to be, has already been the site of a VIP luncheon, which will be part of the uh, celebration all throughout the day and does not, in fact, leave uh, the Philadelphia port till 2 a.m. tomorrow morning. That is a, it's something that is obviously getting the attraction of a lot of people. A lot of people want to see it. And as a matter of fact, uh, we can give you a first bir hand bird's eye view because Action News reporter Chris Wagner is on board. Chris? Hi, Wally. I'm on the Royal Viking Sky now, and there's all sorts of stuff going on here. This is the Royal Pickwickians acting troupe, and they're revolutionary actors who are reenacting various scenes from the Revolutionary War. Let's see what's going on here. Excuse me, Samuel Adams, what are you doing? We'll no longer stand for taxation without representation. We're throwing the British our own little tea party. Right into the ship's swimming pool. Let's go around now and see what's going on in the rest of Yep, there go the tea. You can see that going right over the side. There are more revolutionary scenes going on here, which we will see in just a second. There we go. Now, there's Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin is trying to fly his kite, but he told me earlier that he's been having a terrible time all day long because there isn't any wind today. So let's move on around and see what else we have here. All right, here we have James Madison. Now, this is probably the most appropriate little vignette of the whole day. This is James Madison sitting at the table, and of course, he is considered one of the main authors of the Constitution, and what he's doing is writing his part of the Constitution. You're looking at the Coriolis Ferry Militia. That's a Revolutionary War entertainment troupe based on a group from Bucks County that really was in existence during the Revolutionary War. Behind that, you have George Washington crossing the Delaware. That's being reenacted there. And now as we move up, they're ringing the Liberty Bell, and that's Tom Jefferson there in that pointed hat. He's reading the Declaration of Independence. So that's a little bit of what's going on here today. If we move down a little bit, there we go. We're looking now at Betsy Ross. Betsy Ross is, of course, making her flag, which she allegedly made. That seems to be in some question these days. That's essentially what's going on here. We have all sorts of little groups going on. They've been doing this throughout the day. They did it in the morning as they were coming in under the Walt Whitman Bridge. I think those of you who started watching us early in the day saw that with the fireboats, with the water, and the bunting all over this big ship. And if you look to the stern of the boat, this was going on. All these little revolutionary reenactments were going on. They're doing it again today. They'll do it periodically until about 5 o'clock this afternoon. There's Washington crossing the Delaware. That's obviously something we get to see every Christmas time in the Delaware Valley when that really is reenacted on the Delaware River itself. But for now, it's happening on the Royal Viking Sky cruise ship. Chris, you sure the, uh, those boxes of tea, it isn't really chlorine? They, they, they're dumping it in the swimming pool. I thought maybe they'd have chlorine inside instead of tea. No, but Jim, <laughs> I can't hear you. Yeah, well, it's only tea. Sorry, Jim. And I'm not even sure it's that, to tell you the truth, but it looked pretty convincing while they were doing it. Okay, we'll go back to Liz and Wally now. Just a kind of an interesting uh, footnote. 
when uh, the Royal Viking Sky, or for that matter, any ocean-going vessel comes into the Delaware, in this particular case, it is not Captain Jacob Loeb who docked the ship this morning at a quarter after nine this morning. Uh, what happens is when it comes into the mouth of the Delaware, a river pilot boards the ship and brings it down to just off Penn's Landing, at which point a tugboat comes out, picks him up, and drops off a docking pilot who gets on the ship, and his sole job in life is to dock these big ships. And obviously, with the, the kind of waters that we have, it's a very, very tricky maneuver for a ship that is 672 feet long. You better know what you're doing. And the docking pilot did just fine this morning. As a matter of fact, you're taking a look at it from our aerial view over the uh, Society Hill Towers. That is a big ship. So that docking pilot obviously had to know just exactly what he was doing. And they just they slid it in there this morning like a compact car. It is beautiful to see the uh, the number of vessels on the river. We have the ones that we're always used to seeing, the Mashulu, which is uh, an old grain ship. Uh, right behind us right now and mm -hmm. uh, right ahead of that is the Royal Viking Cruiser. All these people coming down, typically looking at ships is what uh, we enjoy doing here at Penn's Landing. But today, the uh, We the People 200 celebration has made Penn's Landing the focus of all the entertainment that is supposed to carry us from this morning's parade through to tonight's fireworks, with one exception, and that will be at 5.30. There's a big gala going on in West Philadelphia at the Civic Center, which has, a, a, we were talking earlier in the week uh, on AM Philadelphia to some of the people who were in for that. Lloyd Bridges, Dean Jones, Barry Manilow is in for that. Tremendous list of Hollywood stars. Speaking of things that we've talked about earlier this week, it, uh, we have uh, talked about the lighting of the bridge, and uh, the next time we talk to you, we'll give you a little bit of the specifics. But for right now, we go back to Action News and Jim Garden. All right, thank you very much, Molly. And Liz, the presidential motorcade now arriving at Philadelphia International Airport. Let's switch over live to Action News reporter Rob Jennings. Rob? I'm not sure Rob could hear my cue. Uh, if Rob begins to talk, I'll be quiet, but uh, for the moment... Uh... We, we are back. All right, I Rob, hear you now, go. Jim. The uh, state police helicopter is making its uh, sweep around the area, as it always does, so the president must be in the neighborhood and uh, heading back to Air Force One. We are in the northeast corner of the airport, uh, apart from the overseas terminal over near the river, where some corporate jets are hangared, and that is where uh, Air Force One has been sitting for the past two and a half hours. We heard, of course, President Reagan give a very stirring speech on the origins of our Constitution a few minutes ago in front of Independence Hall, a stirring speech, and that was the patriotic portion of his visit here. And, of course, the uh, political portion came uh, a few minutes later, which we heard just about uh, 30, 40 minutes ago here on Channel 6, the political portion uh, in which he spoke to a, a luncheon campaign uh, fundraiser for John Hines, who was running for re-election next year. He resorted to his familiar campaign of attacking democratic economic policies, which led to high inflation, praised John Hines as a senator who helped Mr. Reagan turn the economy around. And then he didn't pull any punches when it came to politics. He took the opportunity at the luncheon to put in the plug for his latest nominee to the Supreme Court, Judge Robert Bork. And Mr. Reagan said his uh, critics have been proved wrong time and time again in the past, and he predicted that they would be proved wrong again this time and that the Senate would approve Bork for the Supreme Court. He also made three predictions, that the next president would be Republican, that John Hines would be reelected, and that the GOP would recapture control of the U.S. Senate. You see the police motorcycle squad coming in now, and we must assume that the presidential motorcade is right behind him. And in just a few moments here, everything is going to be stopped at this airport. There won't be anything moving because Air Force One will own the airport. Nothing will move on the runways or the taxiways when the president gets aboard this plane. And here comes the presidential motorcade. On hand to meet Mr. Reagan will be Connie McHugh, who is, of course, running for city council against James Tyoon. And State Representative George Kenney, they are standing at the foot of the staircase. And here is the presidential limousine. And the ever-present entourage of Secret Service agents. Now, 
everybody's in place. They'll open the door and the president will jump out. And we'll meet Connie McHugh and Representative Kenny. And then within moments, they'll be off to Andrews Air Force Base again. I must say that this really went almost down to the minute. There's Senator Hines getting out on this side, Senator Specter on the other side with the president. So they will apparently be flying back. None of them staying, saying, staying for the gala tonight. President Reagan is now meeting Connie McHugh and State Representative George Kenney. But I was going to say that this has gone right down to the minute, just as the White House advance team had planned. President Reagan's plane landed it promptly at 11.05. Uh, we are about five minutes late right now, but it's gone pretty much to schedule. Rob, Philadelphia Republicans think that Connie McHugh has a good chance to uh, defeat Jimmy Tyune in, uh, in their race for city council. And uh, uh, it's clear that the Republican organization arranges these salutations so the pictures can be taken of, uh, of local candidates who may not be terribly well known uh, with the president of the United States, clearly not uh, injurious to their political efforts. And uh, my hunch is that's exactly what's going on right now. Well, of course, uh, Mr. Tyune has always been strong, particularly in the river wards in South Philadelphia, and it certainly doesn't help if you're running against him. It doesn't hurt to get your picture taken with the President of the United States. Exactly Mr. right. Mr. Reagan, if uh, keeping to form, I'm sure, will turn now at the top of the steps and wave goodbye to us. It's been quite a thrilling day here at the airport and in Center City, too, as well. It's difficult to say, Rob, how many more times President Reagan will be in Philadelphia as President of the United States. Obviously, we cannot uh, pretend the future as far as something like that is concerned, but uh, I wouldn't suspect he'd be here too many more times. I'll tell you something interesting about this plane now that he's inside. This may be one of the last times, Jim, that we see these particular planes. Actually, there is a, an identical plane to this, also known as Air Force One, which uh, serves as a backup. Both of them are in use right now. This one, of course, in Philadelphia bringing the president here, and the other one, which is 10 years older than this plane, uh, took uh, Nancy Reagan to the West Coast to meet with the Pope. And I said that was uh, 10 years older, but Mr. Reagan uh, likes these planes. They're Boeing 707s, which were the first passenger jets uh, used commercially. But some other people who fly in the planes think that they are uh, too cramped. So Boeing is now building two jumbo jets, which will serve as Air Force One. They're 747s, the jumbo jet and they should be delivered uh, sometime at the end of next year. This is a fascinating plane, and I wish I had time to, to describe more of it. On top of the fuselage, you can see so many uh, a string of antennas up there, and you can really, uh, from this airplane, anywhere in the sky, you can make a, a telephone call or a radio transmission anywhere in the world, and they can scramble it for you so that nobody can listen in. It's got very sophisticated communications equipment, the president's quarters are uh, located right under the, the end of the word United there and just at the beginning of the word States, right in front of the wing. And then they have a, an oval uh, table where they sit, or it's very cramped quarters, but where the president and his advisors can sit around just under the word States and the press usually rides in the back. Although today, uh, some of them had to take uh, a plane of their own. Incidentally, now, as this plane leaves, I don't know whether you're going to be able to see this or not, but here's something to look for as the plane starts to roll away from us. Just below the wings and just above each of the engines, there is a round cylindrical device, which is about a foot in diameter, and as you look at it, it will have a mirrored image. It'll look like you're looking into a mirror. And I asked what those were and was fascinated to learn that they are anti-missile devices right above each engine. And uh, heaven forbid if any kind of surface-to-air missile or air-to-air -air missile were launched at this airplane while it were in the sky, the anti-missile device would send out an energy burst of, of tremendous heat and would create a, a, a false heat signal which would attract the missile and explode it before it got uh, near the engines. You'll be able to see those hopefully as the plane taxis off. Now, once again, everything is stopped here at Philadelphia International Airport. There are no planes or trucks moving anywhere on the runways or taxiways as Air Force One owns Philadelphia International until it's in the sky. President Reagan's very brief two and a half hour trip to Philadelphia on this historic day is now itself history.
Could you believe that it started raining here again? There are the anti-missile uh, devices right below the wing and above the engines. It has just started raining here again, Jim. It had been raining all morning until the president's plane rolled up here. As soon as the plane stopped here on the tarmac, the rain stopped. The president and Senators Hines and Specter got out without the need of an umbrella. When they got into the limousine, it started raining again. It's been clear until they just uh, arrived, and now that the plane is leaving, it's raining again. Jim? But no delays for Air Force One. <laughs> President Reagan returning to Washington, and of course uh, the next several days will be uh, dramatic for the President of the United States as he may see finally an agreement, an arms agreement between the United States and the Soviet Union, and uh, of course the ongoing confirmation hearings involving his uh, nominee for the U.S. Supreme Court, Robert Bork. President Reagan leaving Philadelphia on this Constitution Day, and we will continue our coverage in just a minute. potato chip that's missing something. New Pringles Light Barbecue. Know what it's missing? A lot of the fat you get in their regular potato chips. Mm. But you'll never miss it. And it's missing a lot of the salt you get in those chips. Mm. But you'll never miss it. New Pringles Light Barbecue in the silver can with so much tangy barbecue flavor. You'll never miss what's missing. Now, McDonald's introduces something. McDonald's introduces... New Garden Salad! Toss me a salad, a crisp new taste. Toss it for me fresh all day. New McDonald's Garden Salad! The taste goes any place. It's a good time for the great taste. What McDonald's... Oh. Macy's has savings designed with you in mind. A $2,000 Chesterfield leather sofa, now $999. Handmade Chinese 100% wool rugs, $399. 50% off a huge assortment of bedding. And Magnavox's 20-inch TV with remote, only $299. Thursday through Saturday at all Macy's in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. We're Macy's, and we're a part of your we tried to make our Heinz home-style gravy just like your homemade. Oh, really? We made it with real beef and beef juices, just the way you do. Oh, yeah? We even seasoned and simmered and stirred it till it was like your own homemade. Well, it's close. Oh, yeah? But where are the lumps? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Heinz home-style gravy, so close to homemade. While we have a moment's respite here, we have an opportunity to uh, address ourselves perhaps in a bit more of a substantive way to that which we are celebrating here today, and that is the Constitution of the United States. Uh, our guest in the studio right now is Professor Burton Kane, who is a professor of law at Temple University. And Professor Kane, it strikes me as being almost poetic that as we celebrate the 200th anniversary of the signing of the Constitution, uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee in Washington is uh, staging something of a public seminar on what the Constitution is and, and uh, why it's so important to us uh, in the confirmation hearings of, of uh, Robert Bork. But this is a more controversial uh, confirmation hearing than we've ever seen, and that's because of the specific philosophy, the judicial philosophy of Robert Bork. What is creating all the controversy? I think the controversy is largely because the Supreme Court itself is evenly divided on major social issues and that uh, Justice Powell, who has just retired, was the swing vote on those issues. When he went to the hospital last year, for example, the court voted four to four, which means no vote at all, on major issues which will determine what our lives will be like. What is, it about, what is it about Mr. Bork's specific judicial philosophy that is creating all of this stir? Justice uh, Mr. Bork, I won't call him Justice Bork, uh, Judge Bork uh, is supposed to be an extreme conservative. Some people call him a radical in this sense because he wants to turn the clock back, so the argument goes, to a time when the Supreme Court did not give all the rights that we now enjoy in the United States. 
he is an advocate of what he calls judicial restraint, which means that the Supreme Court should not find anything in the Constitution except that which is specifically written when it comes to human rights. Therefore, he would be opposed to practically every major decision of the last 40 years which gave individuals the right to have an abortion, for example, the right to contraception, the right to be free of a poll tax, the right of freedom of speech in, in many situations, uh, the rights of blacks to be free from uh, discrimination and so forth. As I, as I understand it, what he is saying is that if it isn't in the Constitution of the United States, then it belongs in the legislative bodies of this country. Issues that should be decided by our duly elected officials who are closest to the people. I'm not sure that on the face of that, I see anything wrong with that. But what is the issue there? That's what he claims to be saying because he says that in a democratic country you rely upon the majority. The majority passes laws and if you don't like the laws you vote out the people who make the laws. That when the Supreme Court invalidates Or you the make law, a constitutional amendment. Or make a constitutional amendment. But that's so difficult to do that we can't really rely upon that for day-to-day -day, uh, legislation. What, what he says is when the Supreme Court invalidates the law that means the system is not working. That should be such an exceptional situation. It should only be when the Constitution specifically provides for it and therefore as you know, since the Supreme Court of the United States invalidates hundreds and hundreds of laws and has for the last almost 200 years, he would reverse all that process. Now, on the face of it, it may sound reasonable, but if you look at it closely, I think it sounds very unreasonable. The reason being that many of our rights are not even set forth in the Constitution at all. There's nothing in the Constitution which says that a person is innocent until proven guilty. We have to imply that. There's nothing that says that in a criminal case, the government has a burden of proof, but we find our society would be uncivilized unless we have those rules. It's only when you get to further illustrations, such as whether or not you have a right of privacy, that is, a right for the government not to interfere with your personal sexual matters, whether or not that should also be included. What the Supreme Court has done over the last 40 or 50 years is to say these very personal rights are obviously to be included because the Constitution is not to be limited or frozen to 1790 or to the year of any particular amendment. And in fact, the warrant for that is found in the fact that we do have not only specific provisions in the Bill of Rights, but we also have general provisions, such as the government shall not deprive anybody of liberty without due process. Now, Judge Bork, as I understand it, agrees in certain situations that that is true. Why he doesn't agree in other situations, as Arlen Specter pointed out in his very sharp cross-examination, is simply a basic contradiction in his own philosophy. All right. You stay with us for a while because we're going to try to tap your brain a few other times as the, the afternoon progresses. But right now we're going to uh, take a break and then we will continue our coverage of We the People 200, Constitution Day in Philadelphia. Stay with us. The optical department at Sears is where America shops.